today on Call Out, Nelson Sar is en route to rescue a snowmobiler who's crashed 30 meters down a mine shaft. There's an old mine right there. Okay, let's get down there. And later, avalanche dogs learn to find people buried in the snow. As always, it's the handler that needs the most work. The dog's got everything dialed. Have you been briefed on what we got going on? Yeah, the guy in a hole. Yeah, guy in a big deep hole. Tuesday, 3.22 p.m. Nelson Search and Rescue raced to the site of a snowmobiling accident near Kootenai Pass in the Selkirk Mountain Range, an area prone to deadly avalanches. On board the helicopter is team leader Chris Armstrong, medical doctor Mike Guinness, and veteran avalanche technician John Tweedy. Ken Gaddick from nearby Creston was snowmobiling in the backcountry with his son and a friend when he drove straight over an abandoned mine shaft. The snowmobile barely made it across the opening, and Ken fell backwards, tumbling a staggering 30 meters down a series of steep inclines and vertical drops. Badly injured, He's now trapped partway down the shaft, unable to move. When I read the pager, it came across the cell phone, snowmobiler in a mine shaft in avalanche terrain. It was kind of like, oh, well, was this a test? <laughs> a call to stand by has been placed to mine and cave rescue experts in the region. Old mine shafts can be extremely dangerous because of loose rocks, falling debris, deadly gases, or lack of oxygen. Rescuers have died inside mines while attempting to save others. If we can do the rescue safely, we'll do it. If not, I would stand by, secure the area, and we'd wait, whether an hour or 12 hours, for mine rescue to show up. They're fresh both ways, but if you can see which way the last... With limited information about the exact location of the accident, the team is forced to search for snowmobile tracks in the dense forest below. Let's follow that one. This is it fresh on there? Um, uh, just give me a sec here. There's a road, uh, high, hiking up. Within minutes, those tracks lead them directly to their target. There's an old mine right there. Bob, Bob. 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 Right up on top there. Affirmative, we found location. When the helicopter came around to the right angle, you could see the mine shaft. It was 10, 12 feet square, big black hole on the side of the mountain. Totally blew me away. Thought, what the heck is that doing? There? I say we're pretty safe, eh? No, you're good, Chris. Okay, let's From his vantage point in the helicopter, avalanche technician John Tweedy gives Chris the green light to proceed with the rescue. John, watch that tree on your side for me. I got it. Are we okay there? A small group of snowmobilers eager to help brief Chris on the situation. How is he secured to this rope? I believe he uh, secured around. himself down there. Yeah. So he's on the line now? Yes. Yeah. How far down is he? Uh, he's right there now. I believe he's with the, the other two guys. Rope. Okay, my name's Chris. I'm with Nelson Search and Rescue. Who do I have down here? I got Steve and my dad Ken is the one that's hurt. Steve and Ken, is that it? Forever. Okay, nobody move, okay? We're gonna get ropes. To his surprise, he finds not one, but three men inside the shaft. Ken's son Steve and family friend Trevor had climbed down to rescue him. Using a snowmobile tow rope, they've managed to drag him two thirds of the way up the shaft. All three men are now waiting at the bottom of the first vertical drop, about seven meters from the surface. Just hang on, we're gonna get this set up a lot safer and get an attendant down there to help you guys out, okay? Seeing those guys down in the hole told me two very important things. Number one, they have a good air atmosphere. They've been in there for hours. Number two, they're on a stable platform. They're in a place where they're not going to be able to fall down further. What are you guys, what's the situation with uh, Ken down there, guys? Dr. Mike Guinness assesses Ken's condition as best he can, given the distance. He's been conscious the whole time? Miraculously, the subject appears to have broken only an arm and a foot. Okay, helmet coming down, watch for rocks. Chris lowers Trevor's helmet down to ensure that everyone is protected against falling rocks and heavy snow. Is our truck there yet? It's at the pass. Yeah. As dusk approaches, search and rescue members, including rope technicians from Nelson, Caslow, Rossland, and Creston, arrive on snowmobiles provided by local snowmobiling clubs. 
we're pretty much set up here. We just got to dig a bit of a trench and get things going. We got lots of good people up here, so this should go pretty smooth. With the hull system in place, the rope team lowers attendant Randy Law down the steep slope to the first ledge, where the three men are huddled. The two uninjured subjects use flashlights to illuminate the scene as Randy checks Ken for head and spinal injuries. When we arrive on scene with a subject, we really want to assess their state of mind. Are they alert? Are they panicked at all? So Ken was uh, very alert and was able to communicate fine. He was anxious to get out. Ken is strapped into a screamer suit, a harness specifically designed for short hauls. The screamer suit is hooked to Randy's line, allowing Ken to dangle under him while he uses his feet to scale the rock wall. Okay, what becomes more challenging is on the slopes because at that point, the, the subject often is on the ground still, and uh, you physically have to, to pick the person up and uh, drag or skid them along. And you know, then we explain this to Ken at the start, that this is where there would be some discomfort to him. Dr. Mike Guinness attaches splints to Ken's broken arm and foot before securing him into a rescue toboggan. Above ground now, Ken's son Steve and Trevor join a snowmobile team assigned to tow the injured subject down to the nearest road where an ambulance awaits. I couldn't imagine falling in that hole, pinballing, bouncing off all those rocks, not knowing what was up or down, and landing in the dark hurt. Nobody around. It's quite an event he went through. I was taking one more run up the hill and um, went between two trees and over a slight rise and immediately in front of me was the large hole. Ken is thrown backwards into the dark chasm. His snowmobile wedges into a snowbank, teetering precariously over the mouth of the mine shaft. I was very and instantly afraid that the machine was gonna follow me down the hole and land on me. But that fear quickly went away as I hit the ground and started rolling backwards into a series of head over heels kind of somersaults. I remember thinking to myself, I'm not gonna stop. How far am I gonna go? When am I gonna stop? After crashing and tumbling down over 30 meters, Ken finally comes to a stop. All of a sudden, I was sitting upright on a little bit of gravel in complete darkness. And it's not that it's dark, it's that there is a complete and total absence of light. Um, you can do whatever you want, squint, hold up your hand. There's just nothing to see. Meanwhile, Steve and Trevor are at the mouth of the mine shaft, fearing the worst. It was, it was scary, you know, not knowing what had happened because you didn't hear anything and how far he actually was down. We didn't think he was that far down. Steve scrambles down to the bottom of the first drop. At that point, he could hear his dad clear enough. A longtime member of the Kokanee Country Snowmobiling Club, Ken knew instantly what had to be done. I said, you have to send Trevor for search and rescue right away. But I did ask Steve to stay in the hole and talk to me so that I wasn't left alone down there. While Trevor makes his way back to town, Ken and Steve sit tight, trying to stay positive. I had a couple of, of those irrational type fears where I started thinking stupid things about what if the mine shaft collapses or a big rock comes down. And I quite literally just chose to push those out of my mind because there wasn't anything I could do about that anyway. After contacting search and rescue, Trevor joins Steve at the first ledge in the shaft. They tie a flashlight to a backpack and lower it down the tunnel with a rope. Again, it wasn't a straight drop. It was around a couple of corners. I didn't think it was going to get to me. But finally, it did. All of a sudden, it was within reach, and I grabbed it. In severe pain, but determined to climb his way back up the mine shaft, Ken ties the rope around his torso, and Steve and Trevor drag him up towards their position. We were pulling so hard that the rope had no more stretch in it. When he was hanging in the air, you could hear it in his voice that it was hurting a lot. Everything was on the table at that moment. It could have either gone horribly wrong or it could have worked. And as it turned out, obviously it worked. 
Now huddled together at the first junction and facing a dangerous seven meter nearly vertical climb, the three men hear the sweet sound of professional help arriving on scene. It was a relief when we heard the helicopter coming in. It just felt like it was, it was coming to an end. You know, to me, the ordeal had been going on for a long time. Um, but cresting the surface of the, the snow and about the first face I saw was of my other son, Dan, who looked down and asked me if I was okay, um, which was wonderful. If it hadn't been for Ken's strong will to survive and the resourcefulness of Steve, Trevor, and their fellow snowmobilers, this call-out would have required many more hours and resources to complete. The rescue itself, once we were there and figured it out, was really quite straightforward. The real challenge was organizing 26 people in the dark on the side of a mountain, getting them eight kilometers out to the road, and being able to account for every single person and every piece of gear. That's a big job. Now, avalanche dogs and their handlers race against time to find people buried in the snow. We assessed all these dogs to see if they actually had a good, strong hunting drive. Friday, 12.20 p.m. A deadly avalanche slams a backcountry skier, burying him under a meter of hard-packed snow. Oxygen is running out. In Canada alone, avalanches kill on average 14 people per year. If victims don't die on impact from their injuries, then they perish slowly from asphyxiation, unless found. Once buried, odds of survival are 90% in the first 15 minutes. After 20 minutes, they drop dramatically. Thankfully, today is just an exercise. I want number ones to take three steps forward and halt. The Canadian Avalanche Rescue Dog Association is running a week-long winter course at Fernie Alpine Resort to train dogs and their handlers from all over Alberta and British Columbia. Okay, dogs and masters, forward. When an avalanche incident occurs, these teams can be deployed by helicopter in a matter of minutes. Because their missions are so critical, avalanche dogs begin training at a very young age and don't stop until they retire. Each person here is an active member of a first response group with mountain and avalanche experience. I'm here because I've both responded to avalanches and dug out buddies and I've also been in avalanches. And I'm all about prevention. Public forecasting, guiding, we're about avoiding avalanches, but our last layer of defense is having to rescue. Back in the spring, each dog in the beginner group was individually screened and given the green light. So how we actually started with this group was back in May, we assessed all these dogs to see if they actually had a good strong hunting drive. All these dogs have already passed that. They showed us in May that they did want to search, that they do have that natural instinct and drive. So now, this is where we introduce the game to them. To make the dog do the work, the handler must first convince them that it's a game. Holes are dug in the snow to serve as hiding places. Next, the handler runs away, enticing his dog to chase after him. This should be the person he loves the most in the world. This should be his, his alpha. And he wants to go and find him. He's going to dig him out of the snow, and he's going to get an incredible reward. And that's how we're going to introduce the game of search to the dog. Search dogs must display the drive to find anybody, not just their handler. The quarry is now a stranger. Search. The dog is relying on his eyes to find the quarry. But in an avalanche aftermath, often the dump of snow will conceal all traces of visual evidence. This time, the dog will have to find two quarries, both of whom will be completely hidden from view. We're taking it out of sight so it can't see which uh, the hole the person went into. This way it's gonna have to use its nose this time. Oh, 
How's that look? At any given moment, our bodies shed millions of dead skin cells, which carry our scent. These scent particles rise through the snowpack and up to the surface, where they act like a glowing beacon to a dog's built-in radar, his nose. I've been doing the puppy group for over 10 years now, and I think that in the first day, this is one of the strongest groups I've ever seen. Further up the mountain, in an area prone to actual avalanches, the advanced group is also busy training. Some are attempting advanced certification for the first time, while others are senior SAR dogs striving for validation renewal, which is required every 12 months. If they're successful in this validation search, then they become an operational avalanche rescue dog team, or they could be up for revalidation. We have to recertify every year. To obtain validation, the dog handler teams must show that they can successfully locate all the hidden articles within a set amount of time. So we've got a couple of articles that are buried here there to simulate a deeply buried person. They've been buried overnight, and we're going to track up this site to give it some fresh surface contamination, and then we're going to bury a pack for 20 minutes to simulate a, a live person that's buried shallow, and then the handler's going to work the site after it's aged for about 20 minutes or 30 minutes or so. What's that? Good girl. Is this person alive? Uh, he is alive, yeah. What can he tell me? He, he, he was king, he got caught, and his buddies are behind him. His buddies behind him, okay. Yeah. We got to fight two more buddies. With the mercury plummeting to minus 25 degrees Celsius, it takes a lot of dedication to soldier on. We got a little bit of frostbite going on. Trying to keep them warm. You're doing good, buddy. We're uh, doing a scenario where there's been an avalanche and we've got, uh, uh, like in this case, we have three people that got caught in the avalanche. We try to do the uh, worst case scenario. In this case, we basically have the dog handler showing up and he's in charge, he's the only one basically. So we're making it kind of uh, a bit more stressful scenario. Both handler and dog are put under the microscope. What do you got in here? Good dog! Although there are good things dog. you can always work on and, uh, and oh. parts that I, I missed, uh, we had a good search. The dog worked well considering the cold temperatures, uh, good pursuit. Um, as always, it's the handler that needs the most work. The dog's got their everything dialed. So, no, congratulations. Thank awesome. you very much. Good work, yeah. And then uh, work on these little points. And, uh, okay. Be good. good. Yeah. You good boy. Good boy. Hey. Yeah. Are you a good dog? A helicopter arrives to take the advanced group to the top of the mountain to continue with the validation process. What we're doing here is running a scenario and uh, dropping dogs off uh, via the helicopter. So there's a, an element of stress and everything else involved in this with the machine, but it's also to make it as most realistic as possible. Years of training have taught these dogs to ignore the frigid cold and the chaos around them. This scenario is meant to mimic the real deal. Multiple dog and handler teams working together in a race against the clock. Guys, we got possibly nine, maybe eight, okay? No last seen point, possibly wearing beacon, okay? Everyone look at their beacon, make sure they're all on search, okay? They waste no time honing in on the scent pools. Are they alive? No problem. Unresponsive. Thank you, that's awesome. What do you got there? Let's get it out of there, come on, let's go! Let's get it. Yeah, let's get it out of there. Despite the gravity of the situation, the handlers reward each find with enthusiastic praise. In real life, they must keep this up even when the dog yeah. finds a deceased person. Got another big dog. The reward is what motivates them to keep searching. The senior avalanche dogs show why they are so valuable. Within a short 12 minutes, 
all the missing subjects are accounted for. The simulation comes to an end, wrapping up day three of the seven-day course. In reality, for these working dogs and their handlers, training is never over. For this reason alone, certified avalanche SAR dogs are a scarce breed. A lot of people start to realize that the commitment that they have to go through to be in the time and place to do it isn't what they wanted. And dogs change, people change, sometimes lifestyle changes, what have you. So we have about a 40% dropout rate through the careers of most of our dogs. But those who are able to make this huge commitment do so because they know the avalanche dogs provide the public with an essential service, one that can make the difference between life and death. Call out search and rescue features real stories filmed live by search and rescue teams during actual missions. Find out more at calloutsar.tv.